in, in a foul humor. Uh, Bragg, I think, was a better general than he often gets credit for. He was a brilliant administrator. He was actually a pretty decent strategist. Uh, the men didn't like him. He was not a, a happy man. He was difficult to to get along with. And of course, there's the, the the legendary story of how in in the regular army in the years prior to the war, he was stationed at an outpost in the West where both as the commander and as the quartermaster, he engaged in a written quarrel with himself over orders of supplies. So I guess that ought to tell you what you need to know about Braxton Bragg. But Bragg had actually come up with a pretty solid plan. Uh, Rosecrans, after maneuvering Bragg's army out of Tennessee uh, during the Tullahoma campaign, uh, had actually begun to develop some, some thoughts that uh, will end up being a, a pretty good campaign strategy uh, against a, a Rosecrans to be, frankly, become a little overconfident in, in the abilities of his army. So Bragg had concentrated his army on the east side of Chickamauga Creek, hidden in the dense forest from the eyes of the Union Army. While the Federal Army laboriously inched southward from Chattanooga, Bragg's army was preparing for battle. Bragg had been heavily reinforced with two divisions from the Army of Mississippi and an entire corps from the Army of Northern Virginia, although it's the, the, the Easterners were only just beginning to arrive uh, to reinforce the Army of Tennessee as these events uh, that we're talking about this evening are taking place. The original plan was for Bragg's army to attack Thomas's, uh, George H. Thomas's 14th Corps as it crossed Chickamauga Creek and began its climb up Pigeon Mountain, and to then crush the 14th Corps before help could arrive. Other segments of Bragg's army would wait for Major General Thomas Crittenden's 20th Corps and then attack it. And then finally, the full weight of the Confederate Army would be, come down on Major General Alexander McCook's Corps, destroying the Army of the Cumberland in detail, Corps by Corps. By September 10, Rosecrans had begun to realize that Bragg's Army was not retreating. Units from Thomas's Corps began to report the presence of large rebel units. Major General James Negley's division encountered a strong rebel force when it crossed the Chickamauga, and Negley was forced to retreat. Thomas reported back to Rosecrans that the enemy was no longer falling back in disarray uh, as it had been uh, and as he had been led to believe. Thomas and McCook were concerned about being spread so far apart. So after consulting with Thomas, McCook started making plans to shift his corps northward and closer to uh, Thomas's corps. In the meantime, Wilder's brigade, which was now temporarily attached to Crittenden's corps, and on September 11, it marched near Ringgold, Georgia, where it skirmished with Colonel uh, James Scott's brigade of Confederate cavalry, driving it toward Tunnel Hill and then skirmished for half an hour with a second rebel force before driving the enemy back toward Buzzard Roost. The next day, the brigade was ordered back to Ringgold, about four miles from its destination. Uh, Wilder's brigade encountered pickets from Brigadier General John Pegram's cavalry division of uh, Nathan Bedford's command. Nathan Bedford Forest Command. The brigade attack and drove Pegram's units down the road to Lafayette. Soon Wilder learned the Brigadier General uh, Otho Stroll's uh, Confederate brigade was deployed across the road at Lee and Gordon's, or near Lee and Gordon's Mill. Wilder's brigade was cut off, virtually surrounded by enemy forces. Luckily for Wilder, the Confederates hesitated to attack his brigade and knowing the not knowing the composition of the Union force that had suddenly appeared in their midst. At dusk that day, Wilder ordered his men to build large fires over uh, a large area to make the enemy believe that a large force was camping for the night. While the 72nd Indiana and 98th and 123rd Illinois formed a line of battle with Lilly's battery, the 17th Indiana started searching for a way out. Scouts were sent out to round up some local inhabitants who were threatened with death if they didn't uh, agree to lead the Union forces out of the trap. And by 8 p.m., the 17th Indiana had found a way out, and the brigade began to march north past the pickets of Strahl's brigade. The brigade got out of the situation without losing a man. It's really kind of remarkable. While this brigade reached Crittenden's position about midnight, tired from the long and arduous march, but yet happy, to have escaped certain capture. 
With more and more units reporting encounters with rebel units, Rosecrans decided to unite his three corps and messages were sent to Thomas and McCook to concentrate their forces on Crittenden's Corps. The Army of the Cumberland was still vulnerable to attack and Bragg was now ready. On September 15, Bragg announced his final plans at a meeting of his senior officers. He intended to march northward and then west to interpose the Army between Chattanooga and the Union forces. <clears throat> Excuse me. This would force Rosecrans to either fight or fall back across the Tennessee River to maintain his lines of supply. By September 17, the forces on both sides were moving northward and it was only a matter of time before they would inevitably collide. Rosecrans re realized that the vital crossings over Chickamauga Creek needed to be defended, yet he was not, still full, or not yet fully convinced that the rebels had anything more than a few cavalry units in the area. To counter any threat by Confederate cavalry, he ordered Wilder's Lightning Brigade, along with Colonel Minty's Cavalry Brigade, to defend Reed's and Alexander's bridges. The two brigades were all that would stand in the way of Bragg's efforts to cut off the Union Army from Chattanooga. So here is where the first real distinction can be drawn between what John Buford did at Gettysburg and what was done by Minty and Wilder at Chickamauga. Buford was, buy, was buying time to allow the main body of the Army of the Potomac to come up and reinforce him. He knew that if he held out long enough that at least the left wing of the Army of the Potomac, consisting of the 1st, uh, 3rd, and 11th Corps, would come up and take position. Here, Minty and Wilder are operating entirely on their own. They had no reason to expect Bragg to send reinforcements. They had no reason to believe that they were going to, uh, in any way, shape, or form, uh, be trading space to buy time for reinforcements to come up. And that is an important thing to keep in mind as we talk about what they actually accomplished on the 18th of September. On the morning of September 17, Wilder's Brigade headed for Alexander's Bridge, three miles north of Lee and Gordon's Mill, while Minty's Brigade was sent to Reed's Bridge, which is about two miles farther north. Both commanders saw evidence of strong Confederate forces in the immediate area, Dust clouds could be seen rising from the east side of the creek. Minty reported his concerns to Crittenden, who had his headquarters near Lee and Gordon's Mill, and who simply discounted the reports that Minty was sending in, believing that all was there was scattered Confederate cavalry. This, of course, is a parallel to the reaction of the Confederates at Gettysburg when they learned that cavalry forces from the Army of the Potomac had arrived. And the assumption was that they were just militia. Nobody could believe these were actual forces of the Army of the Potomac. Despite re continued reports of increased Confederate activity in the area, the Union commanders failed to realize the importance of safeguarding these crossings. In effect, leaving only two undersized brigades to defend the entire left flank of the Army against 16,000 Confederates. So on the night of September 17, Minty sent some, several worried dispatches to Crittenden, uh, stating that he could hear train after train arriving at Ringgold and unloading Confederate infantry. These are the men primarily of James Longstreet's Second Corps, Army of Northern Virginia, who had been sent to reinforce uh, Bragg's army. Convinced that an attack was imminent, Minty had his men awaken before daylight on the morning of the 18th. They fed their horses and ate their meal as the first rays of daylight made their way over the mountains. At daylight, the horses were saddled and the artillery was harnessed, camp was struck, and gear loaded and sent to the rear. Now, I want to talk to you about some concepts here. And one of the, the concepts I want to discuss with you is something called a covering force action. This is a modern term of modern military parlance. Uh, what a covering force action is, is it is an action that is intended to deceive the enemy. It is intended to draw the enemy in to a, a general engagement. It is intended primarily for the purpose of covering the, the infantry, holding the enemy away from the position that the main body of the army is ultimately to occupy, the purpose of which is to trade space 
and for time. Inflict some casualties on the enemy, make them deploy, make them uh, put up resistance, uh, force them to, to fight their way through, all of which is intended to uh, buy time. So the map that you see in front of you uh, is a map that indicates as best as we could locate, and this is to some extent uh, some uh, guesswork on our part because none of these positions were mapped, but they're positions that make sense of where the some of these Union vedette lines were situated on the night of September 17, 1863. Vedettes are mounted sentries posted in front of an army. Vedette posts typically consisted of three or four men, typically commanded by a non-commissioned officer, usually a sergeant. They're located anywhere from 30 to 50 yards apart. Their purpose is to act as an early warning system. They're to send up the, the alarm. They're to resist as long as they can before they fall back upon the vedette reserve, otherwise known as the Grand Guard, which you see depicted uh, almost in the exact center of the map that's on the screen. And then, of course, the main body uh, is going to uh, take up its main position. That's the position that, that the command is looking to defend. So take a look at, at Minty's command. Minty, by his own acknowledgement, this comes directly from his report, had 972 officers and men with which to hold back roughly 8,000 Confederate infantry. By contrast, John Buford with his two brigades had 2,900 officers and men. Now granted, he will ultimately face uh, a larger contingency of Confederate infantry than were faced at Chickamauga by uh, Minty and Wilder, but you can get a sense now of the task that, that Minty in particular has to undertake. He's got to hold against a force that is nearly 10 times the size of his to buy time. What are they buying time for? To allow Rosecrans to reorient his army and realign it so that it can be in a position to face an attack should one come. So we can take a look at the terrain features here. We have Peavine Creek. Peavine Creek today is kind of slow and sleepy and and is algae filled and is kind of nasty looking because it's dammed up, but it's not very wide. It is a little deep. Uh, Minty's camps were along Peavine Creek. Then roughly half a mile to the rear of Peavine Creek is Peavine Ridge, which is a dominant ridge. And uh, as you can see, the uh, Reeds Bridge Road passes through Peavine Ridge, but it's a narrow opening and one that can be defended. Finally, you have Reeds Bridge, over Chickamauga Creek. It's at a point where there's a fairly sharp bend in the creek. It is a place where it can't be forded because the banks are steep and the water is deep. However, there are banks, there are, there's another bridge, Dyer's Bridge, about a mile and a half to the north, and north of it is a ford. To the south of Reed's Bridge is Byram's Ford, and to the south of Byram's Ford is Alexander's Bridge, which is the position that will be held by Wilder's men. So if the Confederates can force their way through, Reed's Bridge, while a choke point that can be held, is also a position that can be flanked. And this will be problematic for Minty as he deploys his troops because he doesn't have sufficient forces to be able to cover his front. So Minty was expecting trouble on the morning of September 18, and just before dawn he sent out two large patrols. A battalion of the 4th U.S. Cavalry, 100 strong, was sent southeast in the direction of Leet's Tan Yard, while a mixed force of similar size drawn from the 4th Michigan and 7th Pennsylvania rode due east toward the town of Ringgold, which uh, is due east of where you see Peeler's Mill uh, on the map. The rest of the brigade stood to arms at dawn, but when nothing happened, they went about their regular morning fatigue duties, taking care of their horses, grooming and watering them, feeding them. There was even time for the soldiers to have breakfast and a smoke, according to Sergeant James Larson of the 4th U.S. Cavalry. However, that quiet interlude was interrupted about mid-morning when sharp firing broke out to the east. Captain Bear Thompson of the 7th Pennsylvania Cavalry commanded the mixed battalion heading in the direction of Ringgold that morning. The troopers collided with Confederate infantry uh, near Peavine Creek, 
where Thompson managed to delay the rebel advance for some time. Captain William Harder, leading Company D of the 23rd Tennessee, recalled that the initial contact was near Peeler's Mill, which you see on the map there, and the Federal skirmishers retired slowly westward. It was at this moment, just after the initial collision, that Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest arrived with his small mounted force and quickly assumed command over the advance. Forrest's arrival marked a curious moment in the course of the day's events. And, and I'll, I'll just as an aside here, uh, Chickamauga was not one of Nathan Bedford Forrest's better performances. And, and my friend Dave has brilliantly documented uh, the poor performance of both Wheeler and Forrest at Chickamauga uh, in his outstanding book, Failure in the Saddle. So if that's a topic that's of interest to you, I commend Dave's book, Failure in the Saddle, to you. You'll learn everything you could ever want to know about just how poor of a job uh, these cavalry commanders did. In any event, Forrest was originally ordered to provide cavalry to lead the command of Brigadier General Bushrod Johnson. Johnson, by the way, is from my home, my hometown here of Columbus, Ohio. He is a, a, an interesting fellow. He is a, a Yankee Quaker. Quakers, of course, were, were peace-loving peoples. They typically were opposed to war, but that didn't stop Bushrod Johnson. And Johnson is at this point in command of a provisional division. It may, it's made up of various forces and includes the, the initial elements of Longstreet's Corps uh, to arrive in the area. He will ultimately be subsumed later in the day when Major General John Bell Hood arrives and takes command. But for the time being, Johnson is in command of these Confederate forces. He has roughly 8,000 of them. So uh, as uh, Johnson's column and the rebel forces are beginning to make their way west uh, and farther south, uh, Forrest arrives, he takes command, accompanied only by his escort and uh, some Kentucky cavalry under command of uh, General Martin, meaning he's got about 200 troopers with him. Instead of using these 200 troopers for reconnaissance and maneuver, however, Forrest instead ordered them to dismount and reinforce the infantry skirmish line. Johnson had plenty of infantry already, more in fact than he needed. As later events demonstrated, Forrest's men probably would have been better used to threaten the Union flanks, but neither Forrest nor Johnson thought of that, and consequently that opportunity was squandered, uh, much to the great advantage of Robert Minty. Minty, meanwhile, had not been idle. Shortly after 10 o'clock, perhaps 30 minutes before Forrest's arrival, he reinforced Captain Thompson with two more battalions, one from the 4th Michigan and another from the 4th U.S. Regulars, plus a section of two guns, from the Chicago Board of Trade Battery. Taking personal charge of the defense, Minty arrayed the dismounted cavalry in a strong defensive position along the crest of Peavine Ridge. And you see it there in the top left center of the map. Griffin being the two guns of the Chicago Board of Trade Battery. Captain Henry A. Potter, no, not Harry Potter, Henry Potter, commanding Company H of the Michiganders, uh, deployed his men on the left of the Pennsylvanians overlooking their old camp at Peeler's Mill, while the 4th Regulars extended Thompson's right to, to the south. Minty's forward line numbered about 600 men and two guns. What he could not know was that Johnson's and Forrest's combined strength never numbered several thousand at this point. Johnson, too, was operating largely in the dark. Unsure of the opposition he faced, Johnson deployed three of his four infantry brigades in one front line, holding one back in reserve, as you see uh, indicated on the map. He also ordered the Southern artillery to engage Minty's brace of artillery uh, on the ridge line. Crossing Peavine Creek took some time, but when the Confederate infantry reached the West Bank, they began to work around both exposed Union flanks. You know, with only 600 men, that line couldn't extend very long. And after some spirited fighting and a short artillery exchange, Minty began a slow fighting withdrawal back to Reed's Bridge. And again, this is not an action to inflict casualties on the Confederates, although that is certainly a fringe benefit. Rather, it's to delay the advance and continue to trade space 
for time as much as possible. As he pulled back, Minty sent couriers to Crittenden and Rosecrans, reporting the size and strength of the force he had encountered. One sign of movement in particular worried Minty. A dust cloud to the northeast suggested that another Confederate column was heading toward Dyer's Ford, the next Confederate cross or the next crossing site north of Reed's Bridge. Minty had only a small force picket force there and no additional troops to spare. If a strong rebel force crossed at Dyer's Ford, it could move unopposed down the west bank of the creek directly behind Minty, cutting him off from the rest of the army. Accordingly, Minty requested help from Wilder, who dispatched the better part of two regiments, and not keep in mind that Wilder didn't have that much of his own, uh, to help bolster this exposed position and guard uh, Minty's flank. As Minty pulled back, Johnson's men pursued with Forrest commanding the advance guard. And this is the Peavine Ridge line uh, as this advance goes forward. You can see the detail here of the Confederate advance with the brigades of uh, uh, Greg, McNair, and Fulton uh, making that Confederate advance against 600 Union uh, cavalrymen and two pieces of artillery. You can also see the movement of the 123rd Illinois uh, and the 72nd Indiana to Dyer's Ford and up to uh, Red House Bridge to guard Minty's flank. This is Reed's Bridge, taken in the 1890s. Looks pretty rickety, doesn't it? Uh, it is not a particularly sturdy bridge. You can still see those abutments that you see in particular to the right uh, are still present there along the creek. You can see them next to the modern highway bridge that is immediately to the left of the bridge you see depicted here. As Minty pulled Johnson's men back with Forrest commanding the, the advance guard, the rest of Johnson's brigade or division followed its supporting distance. He kept his men in line of battle, which made for slow going as they negotiated the wooded and rolling terrain, and the slow pace of the Confederate advance gave Minty the time he needed to fall back and establish a new defensive position. With his camp baggage already packed up and headed to the rear, Minty worked to carefully position his command. The 4th Michigan and 7th Pennsylvania were deployed uh, north of the bridge. Uh, let's see, can we see it? No, we can't. So here, here's uh, the next map were deployed to the north of the bridge, while Minty deployed, deployed, dismounted half of each command as skirmishers. The fourth regulars were also divided. One squadron was sent with the two guns of the Chicago Board of Trade Battery to take up a position to the southwest of the bridge. Well, the, uh, beyond where the creek makes a sharp bend to the west, and you see that depicted clearly uh, on the map. There were a bad ford, as it was described, crossed the creek. The two guns were hidden in some brush with the squadron of mounted regulars in line behind them in support. The other two squadrons of the fourth regulars were sent to a piece of high ground on the west side of the creek overlooking both the ford and the bridge. About this time, Johnson's Confederate infantry arrived to open the next act of the engagement. Once atop Peavine Ridge, Johnson realized he faced but a single brigade of cavalry and moved to deploy his command for a full-blown assault. His lead brigade under Colonel John S. Fulton prepared to attack directly for the bridge, while the brigades of Brigadier Generals John Gregg and Evander McNair moved to the right and left respectively, hoping to flank Minty out of his position. Bringing up the rear in support is Brigadier General Jerome B. Robinson's uh, Texas Brigade, the first elements of James Longstreet's uh, Virginia reinforcements to reach the field, and uh, the Texans would hopefully remain in reserve. As the infantry moved into position, two batteries of Confederate artillery renewed their fire against the Yankees, and as the fighting recommenced, uh, Forrest noticed other Federal troops to the south. It appears he believed there was that they, this was a guard for Minty's camp somewhere upstream, and instead of supporting the Confederate advance, uh, Forrest instead decided to go after this non-existent camp. Forrest asked Johnson to loan him the use of Lieutenant Colonel Watt W. Floyd's 
17th Tennessee Infantry for this venture. And when Johnson acquiesced, uh, Forrest took the whole group, some 600 men, in search of a Union camp that didn't even exist. According to Floyd, the column moved about a half mile south, but before we got in range, the enemy fled. Uh, there was no camp there. So we're not sure who it is that Floyd is referring to as fleeing because there was no significant force of Union troops in that area. But with Forrest off on his diversion and uh, troops diverted, Johnson prepared to attack. Sometime about two o'clock, Fulton's men headed straight for the bridge, hoping to seize it before the Federals escaped. They ran into stiff resistance from the Union skirmishers and the two hidden artillery pieces that Minty had placed upstream. As Fulton's men faltered, Minty ordered the dismounted elements of the, uh, excuse me, the mounted elements of the 7th Michigan and 7th Pennsylvania to charge the oncoming Confederates. So they, they formed line of battle, drew their sabers, and made a charge, creating temporary confusion. The rest of the rebel line, however, turned both of Minty's flanks, forcing him to re attempt a repeat of the morning's disengagement to fall back across the creek, which he ultimately will do. This time, however, the withdrawal devolved into a bit of a scramble. Minty ordered the 4th Michigan over Reed's Bridge, which was so rickety and narrow that the troopers had to cross in column of twos. Once across, the Michiganders dismounted and lined the west bank of the creek to cover the 7th Pennsylvania's retreat. Once all were across, Minty withdrew the guns and lone squadron of the 7th U.S. Uh, backed by the upstream Ford, and the two guns made it to safety on the West Bank and moved back to where the rest of the regulars had been stationed earlier and took up a line of battle on, on some high ground there. Uh, they unlimbered again and went back into action. The last squadron of the fourth regulars acting as a rear guard barely got away. Commanded by Lieutenant Wirt Davis, the two troops, <clears throat> excuse me, were preparing to cross at the Ford when Davis noted that the seventh Pennsylvania was jammed up at the bridge <coughs> excuse me, and that uh, rebel infantry was fast closing in. Wheeling his command around, Lieutenant Davis delivered another mounted charge against the Confederates, <coughs> excuse me, who fell back just far enough to allow the 7th Pennsylvania to finish crossing. With that sharp tactical success under his belt, Davis pulled his own, Mac back, own men back across the structure, and he and his last few troopers halted under fire to tear up the bridge railings and planks, hurling them into the creek and temporarily rendering the bridge unusable. The men advancing in gray and brown showed equal audacity. According to Captain Harder of the 23rd Tennessee, his men drove back the 4th Michigan skirmish line but could not get across the creek. Under heavy fire, Harder pushed his company forward and ordered his men to repair the bridge as best they could and as fast as they could. Tearing planks off the reed house and barn across the road, the bridge was hastily refloored. And you can see the reed house, I think is not, no, it's not on the map. Okay, it's just to the south of the bridge here. <coughs> the bridge was hastily refloored despite the best efforts of Union sharpshooters. Forrest then returned from his little gallivant southward just as the repairs to the bridge <coughs> were being completed. The cavalry leader com congratulated Harder and his Tennesseans for their courage and proceeded to demonstrate uh, a little daring of his own. Crossing the newly replanked bridge, Forrest rode to within 100 yards of the Union line, halted it, and calmly surveyed it under fire before trotting back to the waiting Confederates. This cool display of courage impressed Hardy, or Harder, who re re recalled that Forrest halted with his accustomed, attentive, and intentive manner, took in the situation of the whole line of the, the Federals, while discharge after discharge of grape and canister dashed by him. You know, Forrest was nothing if not a brave guy, and, and this is the, the sort of leadership that caused men to want to follow him. With the bridge repaired, Minty's two guns were unable to prevent the rest of Fulton's brigade from crossing. Once on the west bank, the, the rebels moved north about 400 yards uh, and formed a line of battle facing the Union line from a distance of about 300 yards. 
While Fulton held the Yankees' attention, Johnson attempted another flanking move, this time sending Forrest Cavalry Detachment and another infantry brigade west toward the ford used earlier by the, Confeder or the Federal artillery. Uh, these Confederates succeeded in reaching the West Bank, which threatened Minty's southern flank and rendered his position untenable because now he could, his flank could be turned. This new threat was developing when Minty received a report informing him that John T. Wilder, who'd been defending Alexander's Bridge all day, was similarly being outflanked, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Wilder advised Minty that he was falling back to Lee and Gordon's Mills. Faced now with potential encirclement because his southern flank was completely exposed and Confederates are also moving to the north, Minty had no choice but to withdraw. Riding west along the Reeds Bridge Road toward Rossville, the Federal Cavalry turned south on the Lafayette Road and uh, moved to join Thomas Crittenden's men near Lee and Gordon's Mill. For the rebels, it had been a long and tiring day. Nearly 100 men had been killed and wounded in the opening fight at Chickamauga, and uh, by so doing, Minty delayed the advance of Johnson's command for nearly an entire day. Now, keep in mind that he's doing this with 972 officers and men. It is a remarkable accomplishment, friends. Additional Confederate reinforcements arrived as Johnson's men watched the last of Minty's command retreat. The first on the scene was John Bell Hood, who, although still suffering from his Gettysburg arm wound, was hurrying forward to take command of the, the column that included his legendary Texas Brigade. As a senior officer on the scene, Hood assumed command from Bushrod Johnson. The next and last reinforcement was the belated arrival of Brigadier General John Pegram's Cavalry Brigade. After observing the fight at Alexander's Bridge during the afternoon, Pegram's troopers broke away at some point to move for us, to move to join for us, crossing Chickamauga Creek at Fowler's Ford. Although the distance could not have been more than two miles, it took Pegram several hours to negotiate its course, and as a result, his men contributed almost nothing to either fight. For the men of Wilder's Brigade, the morning of September 18 was clear and beautiful. The men had foraged for breakfast, and by mid-morning, the smell of baked eggs, bacon, and chicken wafted over the area of Alexander's Bridge. Units of the 72nd Indiana and 123rd Illinois had been posted on the east side of the bridge to act as pickets. For, time, for the time being, all was quiet along their front until men of the 72nd Indiana, who had been foraging on the east side of the creek, returned suddenly reporting rebel infantry to the northeast. Boots and saddles were blown by the buglers of each reg regiment, immediately followed by orders to fall in, and the entire brigade took up positions in preparation for line of battle. After sending the units northward to reinforce Minty, Wilder deployed the 17th Indiana to the right of, of Alexander's Bridge with the 98th Illinois on the left side. Dense woods in the immediate area around the bridge on the west side of the creek helped to shield the two units. The creek at that point was narrow and deep with steep banks. The enemy had no choice but to try and take the bridge or find another place to ford the creek. 400 yards southwest of the bridge, the four remaining guns of Lilly's battery were emplaced on a knoll. Wilder had fewer than 1,000 men to, to oppose about 8,000 Confederate infantry uh, consisting of the Reserve Corps of the Army of the Tennessee, commanded by Major General William H.T. Shot Pouch Walker, who I know is a, a particular favorite of Jim Ogden's. Uh, they called him Shot Pouch because uh, he had so much lead in his body from having been wounded so many times. Uh, Shot Pouch Walker was a, a pretty good soldier, though. Now, meanwhile, at Alexander's Bridge, Wilder and his two regiments were engaging another large Confederate force. At 10 o'clock a.m., a company of Southern infantry made the first attempt to cross the bridge, but was quickly driven back by the pickets of the 72nd Indiana. These are the men of Brigadier General St. John Liddell's Brigade uh, of the Reserve Corps. After the initial attack, members of the regiment ripped up the planking on the bridge and built a lunette fort on the west side of the bridge astride the road. 37 men from Company A then took up positions in that lunette, waiting for the next Confederate attack. In the meantime, Lilly's battery of 
four pieces of rifled artillery, opened fire with long-range long range canister and percussion shells. Captain William Fowler's Alabama battery returned fire. One of the Rebel battery's first shells landed near Lily's number two gun, ricocheting, hitting the house of the Alexander, the corner of the Alexander house, and bouncing back among the members of the battery. Private Sidney Speed alertly ran over, picked up the live shell, and hurled it over the log house, uh, where it exploded harmlessly. For the next several hours, Wilder's men traded fire with the 30th and 34th Mississippi, who had taken positions in a cornfield to the east side of the creek. The Confederates continued to attempt to charge the bridge, only to be driven back by Company A, reasonably secure in their little lunette. For almost five hours, Wilder's brigade held off the rebel attack, but eventually Confederate units began to find places where they could cross without opposition. So Liddell's joined by the brigade of uh, General Edward Walthall and also the brigade of, Cur of Arkansas, Arkansans of uh, Colonel Daniel Govan. When Minty withdrew from Reed's Bridge, the Southerners then gained a secure west uh, foothold on the west side of the creek and word was sent to Wa Walker to let him know. At 4 p.m., Wilder reported the crossing of the enemy. Quote, the enemy are crossing Chickamauga Creek at Alexander's and Byram's Ford below. Colonel Minty has fallen back toward Roseville. It's actually Rossville. Has two of my regiments. Colonel Minty reports cannonading toward Cleveland last night. This forenoon, a column of dust arose in Napier Gap, three hours in passing. A large campfire is now seen at Napier's. The column that attacked me came through Napier's Gap. Another column came from the direction of Peeler's. Uh, and this, these, of course, are both gaps through Peavine Ridge. Uh, Colonel Minty reports infantry flanking him on both banks. Close quote. That is an extremely accurate intelligence report. Wilder's men were being pressed from all sides. And this is <clears throat> a, a photo of Alexander's Bridge circa 1895, uh, or 1893, excuse me, for the 30th anniversary. But you can see <clears throat> the steep banks of Chickamauga Creek here. You can see that the creek is wide. You can't tell from the photo, but it is deep. So at least here at the bridge, it's not a position that can be forded. So this is Wilder's stand at the bridge. And you can see this effort and the, the delaying action as Walt Hall and Govan attack frontally and Liddell's brigade uh, makes the, the flank move to the north that ultimately will flank Wilder's brigade right out of its position. Uh, defending uh, Alexander's Bridge. Wilder's men were now being pressed from all sides. Time was rapidly approaching when they could no longer hold their position and would have to withdraw. Wilder had already received word from Minty that he was being forced to withdraw from Reed's Bridge. With Minty gone, the Confederates began streaming across Chickamauga Creek and headed south toward Alexander's Bridge and Wilder's left flank. So you can see that on the, the, the upper map. At 5 p.m., Lilly's battery fired its last rounds, limbered up its guns, and withdrew. The 17th Indiana covered their withdrawal, and the 98th Illinois slowly fell back, fighting as they withdrew. Uh, and this, this, by the way, is Dale Gallon's depiction. It's called Lightning at the Bridge. <clears throat> and you can see the, uh, the Union defenders on the bridge and the Confederates attacking it. Uh, those of you who are familiar with my book know this is the dust jacket illustration that we chose and used uh, for good reason because it depicts the action being described. Uh, Dale apparently spent some time on the ground because it does appear to be a fairly accurate depiction of the terrain. So as Alexander's Bridge begins to fall here, uh, the men of Company A realized that their lunette would soon be surrounded and captured if they didn't do something to escape. They knew that they could not all leave at once, so they decided to, to let two men at a time slip away. Sergeant Joseph A. Higginbotham, in running 30 yards, was shot five times in the head, face, right arm, left side, and right leg. Remarkably, he recovered from his wounds, but later died at Corinth, Mississippi in January 1864. And all the company lost two wounded, as well as 31 of their 37 horses killed. Hard to be a lightning brigade when you're losing your horses like that. But you see how they, they are being driven back and head, they, once they do drive, get driven back, uh, Wilder elects to retreat 
in the direction of Lee and Gordon's Mill, which you see depicted in the lower left-hand corner of the bottom portion of the map. Wilder's brigade fell back about three miles before stopping and setting up a new defensive line. There they threw up breastworks of fence rails, rocks, and trees. The horses were sent to the rear and the brigade prepared to meet another onslaught from the Confederate Army. <clears throat> the 72nd Indiana, 123rd Illinois rejoined the brigade and were placed on the left. Minty's brigade then took up a position to the right of Wilder's brigade. So now the two brigades are united. They have roughly 2,000 men between them, whereas five Confederate brigades moved down the West Bank toward Lee and Gordon's Mill, marching as fast as they could. They ran right into Wilder's brigade. The Southern skirmish line was halted immediately by the deadly fire of the Lightning Brigade's Spencer rifles. Captain Joseph Vale of Minty's command found General Crittenden, the Corps commander, accompanied by Gen General Thomas J. Wood and Wilder at the Vineyard House. He reported that Minty had been engaged since 7 a.m. Crittenden asked the captain, who is it that is coming? What have you been fighting out there? Vale responded, Buckner's Corps, Hood's Division of Infantry and Artillery, and some of Forrest's Cavalry. Crittenden refused to believe the report, saying Wilder has come in with the same outlandish story. There is nothing in this country except Pegram's dismounted and Forrest's mounted cavalry with a few pieces of artillery. Whatever Crittenden was smoking that day, it must have been good. Minty himself rode up a few minutes later and reported to Crittenden that the rebels were now on the west side of the creek and advancing toward the Crittenden's position. Crittenden, still believing that the enemy did not have such a force in front of him, ordered Wood to take a brigade of infantry and drive off the rebel units. While Wood organized his brigade, Wilder and Minty rode back to their units. Wood moved his brigade up, here's John Bell Hood, uh, Wood moved his brigade up to Wilder's position and accompanied by Crittenden, rode to Wilder and demanded to know where the enemy was. Wilder, who by this point was thoroughly disgusted, said, ride forward, General, 10 paces and you will see for yourself. Wood ordered his brigade to form a line of battle in front of Wilder's men. Crittenden added a further dig at Wilder, smirking, Colonel, we expect to hear a good report for you. Wood's infantry advanced into the woods and suddenly met a tremendous volume of musketry from both front and flank. The infantry broke and rang, bowling over Wilder's and Minty's men as they dashed back in panic. Wilder turned to Minty and remarked loudly, well, Colonel Minty, the general has got his report. Wilder and Minty then rushed forward to counter the enemy attack. Meanwhile, Wood galloped off toward Lee and Gordon's mill, but not before exclaiming, by gad, they are here. The Confederates advanced toward the rail, barricades behind which Wilders and Minty's men waited, and you see that depicted on the map. When the rebels got within 30 yards, Wilder opened his troops to open fire. Both brigades sent a hail of bullets from their, uh, their rifles into the enemy. The Confederates were cut down in droves. The Graybacks wavered and fell back, leaving many casualties on the field in their front. The survivors of this first attack reformed in the tree line and emerged again with fresh units advancing toward the men of the Lightning Brigade. As soon as they were close enough, the brigade opened, again opened fire, supported by Lilly's battery and whole sections of the Confederate line uh, ceased to exist. Again, the rebels were forced to withdraw to the safety of the woods and they finally gave up and broke off the attack around 10 p.m. For the men of Wilder's and Minty's brigades, the fighting of finally came to an end. The night of September 18 was cold and miserable, made even worse by the lack of blankets and food for the men because their horses had been moved to the rear along with their bedrolls and equipment. No fires were allowed, so the exhausted men simply lay down in their positions and went to sleep as best they could, shivering on a cold, frosty night. All night long, as Wilder's men tried to catch some sleep, the sound of thousands of marching infantry and hundreds of caissons filled the night air. The entire Union Army was on the march. Rosecrans, finally recognizing the threat, had ordered the, a realignment of his three corps, and Thomas was ordered to march his 14th Corps north beyond Crittenden and extend the Union line northward in order to neutralize Bragg's flanking maneuver and leave the Lafayette Road, which was 
Rosecrans' line of supply and retreat to Chattanooga, <clears throat> excuse me, opened for use by the Army. At 4 a.m., Wilder and Minty were finally relieved and moved their brigades to the west uh, out of the vineyard home. For the first time in 24 hours, the men and horses were fed, sweet potatoes for the men, and two ears of corn each for the horses. Wilder and his officers met to dis discuss the actions of the previous day and to prepare plans for the upcoming battle. The day before, they had been the left flank of the Union Army. Now they found themselves protecting the right flank as the Union forces had shifted position during the night. The bravery of the men of Wilder's Lightning Brigade and Minty's Cavalry Brigade had prevented total disaster from befalling the Army of the Cumberland. Let's just explore this for a second. Had Minty and Wilder not made the stands that they made and had the roads been left open, had Reed's Bridge fallen much earlier in the day, had Alexander's Bridge fallen uh, much earlier in the day and they pushed on uh, all the way to the Lafayette Road, the Army of the Cumberland would have been cut off. And at that point, Rosecrans very well have, may have faced annihilation. Now, he will lose the Battle of Chickamauga, but it could have been a whole lot worse than what it was had he not recognized the threat, used the time that was bought for him by Minty and Wilder to completely realign his army and completely shift his army's position to the north to put it into a position where it could fight an effective battle, which it will do for the next two days. Without the valiant Union stand on the banks of Chickamauga Creek, the Confederate Army would have swept down the Union flank and the Battle of Chickamauga likely would have been lost on the first day. The Spencer rifles, in particular, proved their worth. This, of course, is the monument to Wilder's Brigade. Uh, I apologize, it's, it's the, uh, the resolution of this picture is not real good. Uh, one of the things that's always struck me about this is it's close resemblance to a rook like you'd find on a chessboard. To me, it looks just like a rook. Um, unfortunately, with the low resolution, you can't see the hornets buzzing around the top of it. Yeah. Um, I, I included the photo, <clears throat> excuse me, for the simple reason that if one had to choose a most valuable player uh, of the Battle of Chickamauga, that most valuable player would have had to have been John T. Wilder and his Lightning Brigade. They were literally everywhere on this battlefield, the first and second days of the battle. Uh, they didn't participate so much on the 20th, instead having fallen back to, to this point uh, behind the Union line in, a, in an effort to uh, hold position. But on, particularly on the 19th, the second day of the battle, they were everywhere. And they fought brilliantly. They made, they, they reinforced the legend that they had made at Hoover's Gap during the Tullahoma campaign and were by and far the most valuable players on the Union side. So let, let's just talk a little bit about the implications uh, of what Wilder and Minty did uh, along the banks of uh, Chickamauga Creek. Uh, they had... Uh, obviously purchased a great deal of time for use by the army. Uh, they had allowed Rosecrans the opportunity to shift his army and to completely realign it. They had, instead of holding a, a piece of ground for the army to occupy, they had instead made it possible to keep the army's lines of supply and retreat open. They inflicted casualties on the Confederates. And most of all, they completely buggered up Braxton Bragg's very well laid plans for his battle. Bragg had to basically start over. And the next day, when Forrest bungled again, uh, it again gave the Union opportunity to buy time to allow the, the Army to uh, use its, uh, its positions and its advantages, and it fought a heck of a battle. And but for the error that occurred with the uh, withdrawal of Wood's Brigade uh, at the breakthrough uh, on the 20th, they may have held. We don't know. But that is the significance of what Minty and Wilder accomplished here. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for your time and your attention. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, open up for, for questions here. Uh, we have Mark Harden asks, 
given that Walker eventually outflanked Wilder's position at Alexander's Bridge by simply for fording downstream, why did Walker not do that when he first encountered resistance at the bridge? Well, that's a good question. We don't have a real good answer to it because Walker didn't specifically say. But uh, I think he believed that the Union force was weak enough that it could be driven back and that, that he could uh, use the, the bridge to his advantage. Uh, I think that when Wilder's brigade made it its extended stand and made crossing that bridge a real challenge, uh, I think that's when necessity forced him to seek another option. And, uh, you know, Chickamauga Creek is, is not deep in most of its places. And as, as you all know, there are many opportunities to ford it. And uh, once in particular, Minty got driven off, that made it possible to forward it from both sides, and that's ultimately what the Confederates did. Dave, you're on with us. Please feel free to jump in and add anything you want to add. I would only add that the forward that – can you hear me? First, you can hear you. Got to check. Um, only add that the ford that Walker eventually used actually the rest of the night to get his troops over. Uh, his last brigade didn't uh, end up fording to that bank, uh, to the uh, west bank of West Chickamauga Creek until uh, just about dawn on September 19th. So it wasn't um, a great option. I, ideally, if, if Walker had uh, maybe moved one of his brigades or, or one of his divisions there initially, that might have had a, a much bigger impact. Are there any other questions? Uh, I know the Wilder's troops pay, uh, this is Dan, Darren Weeks. Uh, I know the Wilder's troops self paid for their seven shot Spencers, but did each soldier pay for the guns independently or were they paid for by the regiment? Well, the answer was that originally they were supposed to pay for them individually from payroll deductions. But eventually, the, um, the government recognizing the effectiveness of these weapons, in particular after Hoover's Gap, uh, the government paid off the, the, the balance and the soldiers ended up not having to pay for much of them at all. Mark Harden asked, other federal units with repeating rifles had serious ammunition supply issues during the battle, but not wilder even though Wilder was heavily engaged all over the battlefield. Did Wilder have his own ammunition train or were his troops more disciplined in firing or what? Uh, the answer is all of the above. Wilder, you know, the, Wilder the organized, I ahead, would say, Wilder organized the mule train to carry extra ammunition. The government paid for the ammunition, but Wilder bought as much as he could uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, the individual sol soldiers were carrying um, many rounds during the course of the, th of the three days of fighting. Yeah, and what's to be remembered about the, the ammunition that was being used by the Spencers, unlike the, the typical infantry rifle or even the carbines being carried by some of Minty's units and some of Minty's units had call for revolving rifles. Uh, but the infantry weaponry, you know, of course, is they, they use a paper cartridge and a, a lead ball that had to be rammed down the barrel of, of the gun. Whereas the Spencer was a, a rim shot bullet with a brass cartridge, so they can't use the same ammunition that infantrymen are, are traditionally using at this time of the war. They have to have special ammunition, which means they had to have their own supply. And as Dave correctly points out, he organized a mule train. Any other questions? Mary says, I believe for a while that the first day was the 18th, and after I read your book, even more so, is that debate still happening among the Civil War community? Um, by way of background, traditionally, uh, the accounts of the Battle of Chickamauga have been that it's a two-day battle on the 19th and 20th. Uh, several of the, the reviews of the book have indicated that they believe I made a compelling argument uh, and that Dave has also in his work that it really was a three-day battle 
that began on the 18th and not on the 19th. And, and I think that, that it speaks for itself. It's my opinion, it is a three day battle and ought to be treated as much. And that position is gaining traction slowly but surely. Anybody else? Well, in the absence of any other questions, I want to thank everybody for your time and attention this evening. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Dave Powell for the backup. Uh, thanks to Ed for inviting me. Uh, I think your group is off to a great start. It's a shame that it had to happen in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, hey, we make the best of the situation and do the best we can. And I wish you nothing but the best as your round table moves forward. And I look forward to seeing you all in person and talking to you in person sometime soon. Absolutely. Eric, hey, uh, yeah, just like Dr. Joe, appreciate it, Eric, and the presentation. Uh, next month, November 5th, uh, Chattanooga is part of uh, Hamilton County and the Hamilton County Historian and uh, Tennessee Historical Commission member Linda Moss Mines will be talking about just beyond the Civil War, uh, Chattanooga during the Reconstruction period. So if you're not, if you're unfamiliar with Reconstruction, uh, Linda Moss Mines will present a, a riveting lecture on that period in our history. So, um, so again, Eric, thanks again. Thanks for everyone attending. Hope everybody stays safe out there and enjoy college football, NFL, and whatever else uh, you can enjoy during this period. So thanks again, and I will stay on if anybody has any questions. And Dave, good to see you too, sir. Thanks for joining us. Take and care. And Mike, and Mike Pellegrini, it's good. it was good to see you show up. Yes, sir. Hope well. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Hey, Ed, I hope we have a chance to meet in person. Yes, sir. Maybe 2021, maybe we can uh, make a run at it. I would love um, it. Yeah. Get a vaccine. You, are you in Chattanooga, sir? Yeah, we just moved here. We live in Hickson, right. so we came That's up right. here from Atlanta. I yeah. was in the Atlanta Civil War Roundtable, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, drop my membership there and help you any way I can. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I live in I live in Udawa, just north of, okay. north of the city. So. Mm, okay, cool. Definitely. Yeah, they, I think we'll be making a field trip down there too, probably sometime next summer. Yeah, yeah, we're we're planning on that. Awesome, great, that is yeah. good. <laughs> Once the border opens and I can finally travel again. Uh, that's right. That's right. It'd be great. It'd be yeah. great. We're gonna sneak her over the border, embargo her style. We're trying to come up with a plan. <laughs> I'm a person that was traveling to the U.S. Like I live like 90 minutes from the border. I would go over every five or six weeks. I have not been out of my county since February the 24th. Oh my gosh! Yeah, God bless you. Yeah. God bless you. <laughs> yeah, we're supposed to go to Chickamauga on Easter weekend. Oh my goodness! Oh, that fell yep. through, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, that would have been my third trip there. It's uh. It's, well, well, Mary, Dave Powell, Dave's doing his uh, his his seminar in March. Uh, if you can come down okay. for that, that that would be great. There we go. Yeah, um, I'm using your books, Dave, right now for Darren and I do a podcast together. Oh, cool. <laughs> so I've got a couple of your books here. For. If you have one information on the on the thing in March, the seminar in the woods, just go to Chickamauga blog. I posted it there recently. Okay. Yeah, I got your uh, check by the way. Uh, okay, good. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay. Are starting to flow in. All right. Excellent. Super. Excellent. Super. Great Super. news. Hey, Darren. Yeah. Hey. That's for you, bud. Can you see that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, ouch. Sorry. Ooh, I mean, did, that, did that cost $28.03 by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> that looks expensive. <laughs> I, just, I just happened look, to pick it up. <laughs> the best part about that is you can put it down. It won't leave any rings. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right uh, if Very you good. listen to that football episode of our podcast then yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. God. Yeah. You, you know what though i can't hate on i can't, I can't hate on matt ryan though because he's, he's my mate with the same school sentence he deserved better but what that wasn't there wasn't the, their day oh mm -hmm. i know i know yeah. hey dave did the uh, the cubs win today they did not i don't oh. think
Oh no! Wait, uh, I take that back. They didn't play today. They lost. Play. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay. Because of uh, COVID, uh, any potential for a rain delay, they just postponed the game. They don't That's right. uh, That's right. yeah. try and sit mm-hmm. through it. So yeah. they just canceled today's game. That's Even right. We, yeah. mm-hmm. The the rain was minor, but yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So uh, this is going to be an interesting playoff. No, mm-hmm. it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> One of a kind. <laughs> my Indi- no, my right Indians now. got trounced last night, so they're gone. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, right now we have both the Cubs and the White Sox. Uh, yeah. I think it would be the perfect yep. 2020. Oh, oh wow, that yeah. would be cool. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> that would define the year. It would. Yeah, <laughs> you better believe it. Well, it's, 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 as long as the Yankees don't win. It's the one, it's the one Yankees I'll root against. No doubt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> same here, same here, because they, they trounced my Indians. <laughs> Yankees love or hate them. Yes, that's there's no problem. No <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Well, Red Sox 2021. Oh yeah, man. There you go. I'm so I'm so waiting for the Red Sox Cubs World Series days. Uh, I've been talking about for the last 150 years. So maybe, well, maybe next year. <laughs> that should have been a 2020 World Series. Yeah, you're right. That would have been a world ender right there. <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Well, I will say good night now. Uh, it's good to see you all, and. Uh, Hopefully in March, I will speak to you all in person. Awesome. Good. So I noticed that uh, more roundtables are, are talking about continuing the Zoom thing because we get uh, people from outside the immediate area. So uh, maybe we'll do both in March. Who knows? Yeah. Do it. I'm, I'm do from it. Canada, and this is the first roundtable mm. I've become a oh, member. Oh, fantastic. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Great. <laughs> fantastic. Well, good night, folks. Good night, Dave. Take care. Good night, Dave. Everybody. Joe, yes, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, Dave. Good night. Yep. Good night, everybody. Who all's left? Just me, I guess. Oh, Robert. (laughs) There, Good uh, job, Mary. Ed. It went well tonight. We're jumping off now. Jumping off, Mary. Okay, yeah. take care. You too. See you later. See you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was a good talk tonight. It went really well. Yeah, I uh, didn't have as many people as I, I was hoping. We had 60 sign up, but about 37 at our max. So, Oh, okay. Uh, you know, still good, good turnout, I think. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess – I guess you and I will need to talk about, you know, March and, and meeting in person, you know, how we want to, what, when we want to make that work and how we want to make it work, you know, to yeah. syn- synchronize with Dave's visit, you know. Uh, Ed, I wonder if we can do both at the same time, you know, like meet in person, but yet put it out on Zoom too with a camera or something like that. That would allow us to keep members all over the country, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wonder if that can work. You talking about like a live stream? Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, live that's, stream the meetings. Yeah, live stream. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, you know, and and I have the uh, you know the one location, maybe two locations to meet in person, and I'll reach yeah. out to them probably in a couple of months. And uh, you know, I think it really depends on places that will open up to allow us to meet you know, obviously. So, yeah. You can get the audio visual equipment.